بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم نويت وتعلم وتعلم وتذكر وتذكر والنفع والانتفاد والإفادة والاستفادة والحث لا تمسك بكتاب الله وسنة رسوله ودعاء للهدى ودلالة على الخير ابتغى وجه الله ومردته وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى ربي اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري احلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد مفتاح باب رحمة الله عدد ما في علم الله صلاة وسلام دائما بدوام موك الله وعلى اله ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته ما شاء الله It's a blessing to be here together And this is an auspicious day, alhamdulillah We got to pray with our beloved brothers and sisters From Senegal, from the Mouradiyah And this happens to be the celebration of the Ma'agal Which is the day which commemorates the return from exile of Sheikh Ahmed Ubamba, who was one of the great awliya, one of the great saints of Senegal, and one of the great revivers of the way of the Prophet ﷺ in Senegal. He was someone, even though he's not very well known, he, some people call him the Gandhi of West Africa, but he preceded Gandhi. <laughs> so Gandhi was the Ahmed Ubamba of India. And uh, Sheikh Ahmed Ubamba, they say that because he resisted the French occupation through complete nonviolence. Through complete nonviolence. And eventually, the, his, uh, the French tried many things. They exiled him they, because he was very influential. But eventually, he came back and he founded the city of Touba. Uh, and there's a lot of miracles associated with it because the French let him be there because it was the middle of nowhere, literally the desert. And just like Hajar and Ismail, when they dug, they found a great well. Alhamdulillah, and it's a great place of blessing to this day. And so, inshallah, uh, after our class today, our brothers and sisters have invited us to go upstairs. I think most of it will be in Wolof, in their language. Uh, but they were very uh, insistent that we come and they said they'll have food, so anyone who would like to join after can do that, inshallah. MashaAllah. So, alhamdulillah, many of you were here last week. For those of you that are first joining us at Wasad, if this is your first time, I want to welcome you. We're honored to have you, alhamdulillah. <coughs> this is the day in which we dive into the first chapter of the lives of man. Inshallah, some of you may have seen the video from last week, or some of you were here, in which we gave a kind of orientation or introduction to this text. This text is a great text from Imam al-Haddad, who is one of the great sages of our tradition, and someone who had great insights. And he wrote this book when he was uh, nearing 70. In fact, he says in the introduction, that he had the idea for this book for many years, but that he didn't want to write it before he reached the age of 63, which was the age in which the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, passed away. So he waited until after his 63rd birthday to write this book. MashaAllah. And in this book, his intention is to draw our attention to the fact that life does not begin with birth, and it does not end with death. <laughs> That's actually a very small part of life. And as we mentioned last week, that we as human beings, we are like people that wake up on a train. Where am I going? How did I get here? Who am I? Why am I in this body? <laughs> and so the prophets come with the guidance for, to, to help us understand where we're from and where we're going. And so each week, in the following um, six weeks, uh, five weeks, inshallah, including this week, we're going to discuss one of the lives, one of the five lives. 
and the lives are the first life is the life before this world alam al mithaq that's what we're going to talk about today the second life is the life that we're in now <laughs> the dunya the lower world we'll talk about that next week inshallah the third life is the barzakh which begins with death with physical death and it is the intermediary realm between this world and between the eternal life and we'll talk about that it's the life of the grave but don't think it's just the grave in fact it's a world that's more vast than this world and then the fourth world is Yom al Qiyamah the day of rising where all souls will be brought forth into the Divine Presence again and may Allah be gentle with us on that day and then the fifth life is the two abodes the garden and the fire and what, ha what takes place within them and so that will be the final um, the final week and Imam al-Haddad very beautifully has an afterword to that chapter which focuses on the vision of Allah witnessing Allah which uh, is really powerful and of course is <laughs> the Jannah of Jannah the garden of the garden the paradise of paradise may we all be blessed to witness Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but as for this week inshallah we are going to talk about the life before conception now the Quran MashaAllah, as you all know from reading the Quran, it talks a lot about the lives to come. A lot about the lives to come. However, it also talks about the previous life. The, that which came before us. And there are a number of scenes that the Quran talks about and references many times. And inshallah, we'll look at those. This is important to remember because if you don't know where you're from, how can you know where you're going? Allah asks us all in the Quran, Fa'ina tathabun, so where are you going? But if you don't know where you're from, how can you know where you're going? And we even know this, right? The largest blockbuster, uh, blockbuster Hollywood uh, movies are what movies? superhero movies <laughs> right they routinely smash records of all other movies superhero movies right the DC universe the Marvel universe I don't have to tell you all know the movies right and um, but of course the best parts of those movies and what makes them really interesting and how they're able to actually do many many um, many more is they they give the origin story, right? They give the origin story, or they give the flashback, so you understand, oh, that's why the Joker is the Joker. <laughs> that's why Darth Vader is Darth Vader, right? And likewise, it is necessary, completely necessary, for us to understand our origin, for us to understand who we are. And so, We'll read, inshallah, from these scenes. Inshallah, we'll start with the one that Imam al Haddad mentions first. And he talks about the mithaq. The mithaq. And this is a word that means covenant. Alam al mithaq, the world of the covenant. It's also called Alam al arwah, the world of the spirits, because we were in our spiritual state then. And it's called. Alam al alast the world of alast which is an allusion to the covenant which we'll get into so here is in the translation in surah al-araf verse 172 when your lord brought forth from the children of adam from their loins their seed and made them testify of themselves he said am i not your lord they said yes 
we testify or we bear witness. That was lest you should say on the day of rising, of this we are unaware. And he says the verse following this refers to it also. And so the verse following it is, or that you would say, our fathers before us associated partners with God, and we were just their descendants. Will you destroy us for what the wrongdoers or the falsifiers did? And so this alludes to the primordial realm. وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمٍ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتُهُمْ وَأَشْهَدُهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَا شَهِدْنَا And in this realm, this was the realm of the arwah. In the primordial realm, we were all spirits. As mentioned last week, this is who we truly are. Before Allah gave you a body to be clothed in, before He gave you a nation or tribe, before He gave you uh, a gender, before He gave you a race, you were a spirit in His presence. And in fact, our Prophet وسلم, said in that, in that realm, the spirits were like marshaled ranks. Right? And those that you meet in this world that you have an immediate affinity for, that is because your souls were kindred in that realm. Right? And we meet people who say, I feel like I've known you forever. You did know them forever. <laughs> yeah. Nah. And you can be of the same spiritual tribe as someone who is from a different nation or a different race or a different background. Because ultimately your spiritual identity is primarily who you are. And Allah, before He placed us in this realm and gave us these um, circumstances of our individual lives as a test for our spirit to grow, we were pure spirit. And in that realm, we were witnessing Allah. We are experiencing perfect peace, knowledge, and love we are experiencing divine love but at a specific point Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he was indicating to us that it was time to depart from that realm this is when inshallah this is when our souls receive the divine address alastu bi rabbikum am i not your rabb and we know the word Rabb, it's usually translated as Lord. But a Rabb is one who brings through the stages. And a Rabb of a garden is the gardener. A Rabb of the sheep is the shepherd. And so a Rabb is one who cultivates, who sustains, who brings through the stages of fruition to completion. And so Allah said, Am I not your Rabb? And each human soul that ever was, that is, and that ever will be said with their tongues and with their beings, Bala Shahidna. Yes, we bear witness. And this, in a certain sense, was the indication that something was about to change. We were about to leave this realm of unity, of knowledge, of oneness, and we were going to enter into the realm of separation and of forgetfulness and of tribulation. In fact, the commentators remark that balab is an affirmation. It, it means yes, but it's also the word that means tribulation. <laughs> Bala is tribulation. So we were accepting the tribulation. And the greatest tribulation is distance from Allah. If you have nearness to Allah and you have nothing else, Alhamdulillah. If you have everything else but you don't have that, you have pure tribulation. But of course this 
departure was for a reason and for a wisdom, and inshallah we'll get to that in one of the other scenes. But suffice it for this um, to say, and Imam al-Haddad does mention, that all of our souls were present on that day, and deep down inside we all remember that. Even if we don't remember that we remember. We remember. It is the deepest part of you. And it is ultimately what everyone is searching for. And what everyone is searching to return to. Now, there is much in our tradition about this. And uh, he talks about the black stone. We're going to get to that. Inshallah, I won't forget to come back to that. But first I wanted to share a little bit about Maulana Rumi's commentary upon this, uh, this verse. So Maulana Rumi, as many of you know, is one of the great poets of humankind. And he wrote uh, many poems, but his magnum opus is called the Masnevi. And this is rhyming couplets. It's a great epic poem that's longer than the Iliad and the Odyssey combined. And it is a spiritual commentary upon the Qur'an. He begins it by saying, this is the usul, usul, usul ad deen This is the root of the root of the root of the deen, of the way. And he tells many stories. And all of these stories are to elucidate Qur'anic stories. And to point us back to the fact that all the characters in the Qur'an are in us. This is something that he emphasizes. That when you read the story of Fir'aun, the point is not to say once upon a time there was a very bad man. The point is to know that there is an archetype of the tyrant, of the arrogant one, of the one who desires to be worshipped and to rebel and to subjugate others. That is inside of each one of us. But we also have the prophetic light within each one of us. And, you know, he talks about Jesus. And Jesus in the Quran is called the Spirit of God, Ruh Allah. And so Rumi, very funny, and he takes this from, I think Attar said it before him. But he says, Jesus was riding through the market on his donkey, and Jesus was drunk on God, and the donkey was drunk on barley. <laughs> And then he says, everyone is, is drunk on something, so just upgrade your intoxicants. Everyone is drunk on something. And then he said, most people are drunk on the five senses, meaning they forget their spirit. They're so consumed with this material world that they're just intoxicated. And when they die, <laughs> like the drunkard the day after, oh my God, what happened? What did I do? Right? This is the state of most people. In any case, he, he's talking about us because we have a spirit from God. We have the ruh from God, but we also have the himar. <laughs> we have the donkey nature. That is our lower self, our ego self. May Allah forgive us. But in, in any case, he begins all of these thousands of stories with the song of the reed. It's called the Ne Name. And it begins... Uh, listen to the sound of the reed as it tells a tale complaining of its separations everything or everyone that has been severed from its origin for, from its homeland yearns for the moment of return so give me a breast that is torn by yearning so that I can unfold to such a one the pain of this love desire. This is how he begins the whole thing. So what is he talking about? So Maulana Rumi used to gather with his disciples. He used to gather with his disciples and they would play music, right? Haram. He's a great shoe. He was a, grand, he was a Hanafi faqih, so you take it up with him. 
They would, they would gather and play music because it assisted them in their spiritual states of contemplation and remembrance. And they would play the drums and they would sing and they would play the flute, the neigh. And in these states, Rumi would wait for a spiritual opening to come, for the nefahat, for the sweet breezes from Allah to come. And then when he would find the inspiration, he would start reciting what came to his heart. We called that freestyling when I was growing up. <laughs> he would start to recite. And what he is saying here is that in that flute, he heard the human condition. That each one of us is a flute. Because the flute, as you know, the reed flute, which is popular in the Muslim lands, it grows in the river. It's a reed. But then it's cut and taken out. And then it's carved into seven holes. And then it's given breath. And when it's given breath, it comes back to life and it starts to wail. It has a plaint, like a cry. A beautiful sound, but it also sounds like it's crying. It sounds sad. It's a very melancholy sound. And so in that Rumi heard, and this is what he's saying in this poem, that this flute is crying because it's severed from its origin. It's severed from the riverbed. And each human being is crying. Deep down, they're yearning for the river of divine unity that they know deep down inside. And even though some songs get very off-pitch, <laughs> cacophonic, at the root, that's what everyone is seeking. That is what everyone is seeking. And, of course, in this verse, the word that, it, that we said is shahidna, we bear witness which you will probably recognize is from the same root as the word shahada, right? And when those of us that entered Islam, embraced Islam, said the shahada, this was at that point in our life. For those of you that were born into Muslim families, your family said the, sh the call to prayer, <laughs> which includes the shahada, into your ear when you were born. That's what you do for a Muslim child. You, call, you say the adhan into the right ear and the iqam into the left. And if you notice, what do you do after the adhan and the iqama? Pray. But there's no prayer. Or is there? Does anybody know what prayer is being called into the ear of that newborn baby? It is the call for the janazah prayer. Because the funeral prayer is the only prayer that there is no akama, there is no adhan. We're acknowledging that all of life is a breath between infancy and old age, if we're allowed to live to old age. And that we're just travelers here, as the Prophet ﷺ said. Just like travelers that sit beneath a tree for a little while before we continue on our journey. But the point here is that saying the shahada, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reaffirming that shahada. We are reaffirming what our souls, the covenant that our souls took with Allah in that realm. And we are reminding our souls of what they knew in that realm. In another verse, Allah says that when He sends the, these, the souls from this realm, He says, but don't worry because Huda will come. My guidance will come. I will send prophets to every nation and tribe to remind them of this covenant. One beautiful thing that our Prophet told us 
is that that covenant that we all took on a scroll, every single human being took it, it was then fed to the black stone. That's what our Prophet said, it was fed to the black stone. And the black stone is the record of that. And it descended from the, the paradisal realm into this world to represent the covenant. And so our whole life as believers, five times a day we pray towards the Kaaba and towards the black stone to reaffirm that Shahada. And not only that, but we all know that as believers, we should always know where the Qibla is. Always know. We should always know which direction Mecca is. Because it's the Sunnah that you face the Qibla if you can. It's not haram to not, right? You don't, don't everyone turn around. But if you're just sitting in your room, the Sunnah is that you face Mecca. Even if you're just drinking tea or even watching any the Seahawks or whatever. <laughs> it's good because you're, you're reminding yourself of this covenant. It's the sunnah to set up your bed in your room such that you can lay on your right side facing the Kaaba. It, it, that's the sunnah. That's how the Prophet ﷺ would sleep. And we, again, we're going to be buried like that inshallah on our right side facing the Kaaba and so this black stone that we are praying to Allah in the direction of is the affirmation five times a day O oh Allah you sent my spirit into this realm this whole world and everything in it is only a test but I have never really left your presence, nor will I, inshallah. Because as the Prophet said, and we mentioned last week, the virtual reality analogy, or the Prophet said, the dreamer analogy, the dreamer never leaves the place that he fell asleep. So we all were with our beloved in the garden, and then we fell asleep. And now we're in the dream. But we're still in the garden with the Beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Beloved Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and when we die we will wake up and inshallah we'll wake up in a blessed state and this is also why when we make tawaf around the Kaaba when we circumambulate the Kaaba and inshallah we all get to do it soon together inshallah what do you do? you salute the black stone and what are you supposed to say? Ya Allah, this is believing in you, fulfilling our pledge to you, and declaring the truth of your record. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. And then what do we do? And hopefully not elbowing each other too hard, we try to kiss the black stone and touch it. Touch it. Has anyone here touched the black stone? Inshallah, everyone here will touch the black stone. And what are we doing? What did the Prophet ﷺ say about the black stone? He said, وسلم, it is the right hand of God. La ilaha illallah. The right hand of God. And he symbolically. Symbolically. And what do you do to uh, pledge allegiance to a king? Kiss the hand. This represents, O oh Allah, I am your servant. I am your subject in your kingdom. You are the king of kings. I surrender myself to you. I am not of those who are in open rebellion to you, inshallah. So all of this is, uh, is central to our ibadah, to our worship. Now Imam al-Haddad very beautifully then goes on to say that there can be no doubt that the progeny of Adam yani, 
was possessed of existence, hearing, and speech in that primordial realm. This, however, was at a degree or a dimension of existence other than that of this world. There are many levels of existence, as is well known by those people who know existence. <laughs> and may we know existence, inshallah. Mm. And so this is really important, is that all of our souls were there in that realm, and even if we're not aware of it, we were there. And the Prophet ﷺ has referred to this when he said, I was a prophet when Adam was between water and clay, or between spirit and body. And he goes into this, Imam Haddad, when he quotes that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was already a prophet when Adam was between water and clay, between spirit and body. And he accompanied Adam when he was brought down from the garden, Noah when he boarded the ark, and Abraham when he was thrown into Nimrod's fire. Although this applies to all the progeny carried in the loins of the prophets mentioned here, peace be upon them, the existence of the Messenger of God وسلم, at this stage was more perfect and complete. In other words, while we forgot, the prophets remembered. While most people forgot, the prophets remembered. In other words, the prophets woke up in the dream. They woke up in the dream. They remember that just as if it was yesterday. In fact, they remember it more than that. And we sometimes have dreams where we feel it was more real than this world. May we wake up, inshallah, in the dream. Now, there's uh, more that he goes into here, and uh, it's really profound and beautiful. But I also wanted to bring into this conversation a little bit about the other scenes, because they're also very important. And he doesn't focus on them in this chapter, but they are very important. And this is the two scenes that are told back to back in Surah Al-Baqarah, and they're explored elsewhere. But this is verse 30 through 39 in Surah Al-Baqarah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the meaning of which is, And when thy Lord said to the angels, I am setting in the earth a viceroy, they said, Wilt thou set therein one who will do corruption there and shed blood, while we proclaim thy praise and call thee holy? He said, I know what you know not. And he taught Adam the names, all of them. Then he presented them unto the angels and said, Now tell me the names of these, if you speak truly. They said, Glory be to thee. We know not, save what thou hast taught us. Surely thou art the all-knowing, the all-wise. He said, Adam, tell them their names. And when he had told them their names, he said, Did I not tell you that I know the unseen things of the heavens and the earth, and I know what things you reveal and what you conceal? And when we said to the angels, Bow yourselves to Adam, so they bowed, save Iblis. He refused and waxed proud, and so he became one of the unbelievers. So this is, is, is a passage which is only four verses, but it's very profound and really sets up the drama of life on earth. And the first word that's important technically in our vocabulary from this, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةِ I will place within the earth what Arbery translated as a viceroy, or we have vicegerent. There's many words in English that are English words, but only Muslims use it, right? Circumambulation, <laughs> ablution, she camel, never heard that. Um, vicegerent is definitely one, right? Alhamdulillah, these are like old English words 
And so we're preserving, inshallah. We're preserving English, inshallah. And Khalifa is an amazing word. And really, we could go into it for hours and hours, but just to say a few things about it. Khalifa is one who is a representative, one who is a successor, one who is an inheritor. You could say a steward, someone who is caring for something on someone's behalf. You could even say an ambassador. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this like kind of cosmic drama, this human origin story, in this scene there is Allah, there is the angels, there is the human being, and there is Iblis. That's the cast of characters in this scene. And Allah says to the angels, I am going to place within the earth a Khalifa. And they say, they ask Allah, will you place therein one who will cause corruption, fasad, and shed blood therein, while we hymn your praises and proclaim your holiness? And Allah responds somewhat enigmatically, Inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamu. I know that which you do not know. And this is important because unlike human beings, angels have no free will. They are perfect submission. They are perfect light. Perfect surrendering to the divine will. And when Allah presents Adam before them, they understand the implications of this being that can acquire actions that are in rebellion to the divine command. Because that they're not capable of that. Right? Islam, we don't have this, they have like fallen angels, right, in Christianity. We'll get into that when we talk about Iblis, but he was not an angel. In any case, um, angels are pure submission and surrender. And so a Khalifa is someone who represents, right? So a king will have a Khalifa of his vast kingdom who will care on behalf of the king for a particular region of that kingdom, right? And that Khalifa is in charge of governing according to the wishes of the king. The Khalifa can't just do whatever the Khalifa wants, right? In other words, Khalifa is, is the outside, the zahir, but the batin or the inner reality is ubudiyah. The Khalifa is a slave of the king, right? And it's not that different in our time to use an analogy, right? That the President of the United States has ambassadors all over the world. And of course, the ambassadors, they can't just do whatever they want, right? The ambassador, we're the ambassador to, right? The ambassador from the US to Malaysia, for instance. Were he to just do whatever he want, say he, the, the Prime Minister of Malaysia got on his nerves, were he to say whatever he wanted to him, that would cause problems for <laughs> the nation that he represents, right? He can't just do that. And in fact, I don't know if people know this, but ambassadors and everyone that works in the US embassies, they actually have very short terms. It's like two or three years in a place. And then they get moved. You, you don't stay longer than that, right? Because that it was set up by the founders of this country to, because if an ambassador is embedded in a place for too long, <laughs> they may rebel or make their own uh, decisions and become embedded in that country in a way that is treason, essentially. is treasonous <coughs> to the country that they're represented. So, in any case, uh, this is an analogy. And so, being a Khalifa means you're in pure submission to Allah, but it also means you have the ability to rebel from that command. And so the angels understood the implications, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I know what you know not. And directly after that, 
Because that's an enigmatic answer. What is it that Allah knows? Allah says, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا And Allah taught Adam the names, all of them. And presented them to the angels and said, inform me of these if you are truthful. And they said, Subhanaka la, Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma alamtana. Transcendent are you, we have no knowledge except for whatever you have taught us. And so then, of course, uh, when, and then he, and then he say, they said, Inna ka antul alimul hakim. You are the all knowing and the wise. And then Allah, knowing that the angels could not respond, turned to Adam and said, Ya Adam, anbi'uhum bi asma'ihim. Inform them of the names. And when he informed them, Allah said, Did I not tell you I know the secrets, or the, the unseen of the heavens and the earth? And I know what you reveal and what you conceal. And directly after that is the command to bow to Adam, to our father Adam from the angels. And they all bowed, but not Iblis. He was arrogant and disbelieved. So what we gather from this is that the crux of this, and in fact the crux of the human situation and what separates us from other beings is the secret of the names, is our relationship with the names, and particularly our ability to know. The word ilm, the root of the word ilm, knowledge, is used seven times in these four verses. This is what distinguishes us. We're not, right, there's creatures that are faster than us. There's creatures that are larger than us, stronger than us, have bigger teeth than us, can swim much better than us, can fly and we can't fly. But what distinguishes us is our ability to know and our ability to communicate that knowledge. And so, in a certain sense, the secret of the names is vast and many, many libraries have been filled with commentaries on this. But suffice it to say here is that everything in existence is reflecting Allah's names and attributes. In fact, our scholars say there are only three things, you could say are three domains. There is Allah's essence, Allah's attributes, and Allah's acts. <laughs> that Allah, the essence, sifat Allah, attributes, and af'al, the acts of Allah. And we're the acts of Allah. Everything we see is the acts of Allah. But everything that exists is reflecting some of Allah's names and attributes, divine attributes. Allah says, سُنُّرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ هَتِ يَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ We will show them our signs on the horizons and within themselves until it becomes clear that this is the truth, that it is the truth. And our scholars commenting on that said the horizons represents everything in the physical world, the cosmos, the macrocosm, right? And within the self, that is the microcosm, that is the human situation. So, in other words, to use an analogy from Rumi, we have this, actually this carpet here is from Konya. It's from the city of Rumi. And he said that all of existence is like a beautiful rug that has been woven. And most people are like ants. The ant, when it crawls on the carpet, it sees red, it sees orange, it sees purple, white, black, but it looks like chaos to the ant because it's too close. <laughs> he said, but the, the falcon looks down and sees the pattern, sees what is woven. And in a certain sense, you could say 
that all of existence is woven, right? the threads that weave existence are the names of Allah, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? That everything is reflecting one or more of the attributes of Allah. However, only the human being is reflecting all the names and attributes of Allah. This is what makes us the Khalifa. Right. In other words, you can't understand anything existence without reference to the names. Not even the most quote unquote insignificant thing. You cannot understand a grain of sand without understanding the names. Everything is reflecting some of Allah's names. But only the human being is reflecting all of the names. That's why we are the microcosm, the small cosmos. Right? We reflect it all. And this is something that, inshallah, we can get into in uh, future weeks. But the Prophet وسلم, said, Takhalluku bi akhlaqillah. Characterize yourself with the characteristics of Allah. Qualify yourself with the qualities of Allah. Right? Akhlaq ila akhlaq, we know this word, character. Innaka la ala khuluqun adheem. Allah says of the Prophet, you are in a supreme character. Right. So these divine characteristics. And that's why the Prophets, right, Adam, to Muhammad, وسلم, they perfectly embodied and synthesized all the names. The rest of us, we have all the names. Potentially. <laughs> Potentially. Right? Potentially. May Allah allow us to be characterized by His characteristics and qualified by His qualities, inshallah. And of course, the secret is only through pure submission and surrendering can that ever take place. Now, the last thing I'll say is about Iblis, about this particular verse. Iblis was a jinn. Jinn are a species of beings that are made of smoke, right? Fire. No, not smoke. Smokeless fire. Fire. And the angels are made of light, and the human beings are made of clay, of earth. Right? And something about Iblis that is important to know is that Iblis was a worshiper. They say there is not a place in the heavens or the earth where Iblis did not prostrate to Allah. Iblis spent thousands of years worshiping Allah. You can never play, pray as many prayers as Iblis. <laughs> you can't. There is a lesson in this. And it is said that when Adam's form was created, before before the spirit was blown into him, the clay was there. And it is said that Iblis entered into the clay through the eyes, through the ears, through the mouth, and through the uh, private parts, and slithered around in this clay being. And then observed, observed it studied it and then came to the conclusion that this being is hollow right but if i want to enter this being i can go through these places <laughs> right that's why we have to guard our eyes and our ears and our tongues etc this is a place where iblis can influence us Now, Iblis said in another verse in the Quran, not this one, his reason for not bowing, which is, Ana khayra minhu. I am better than him. I am created from fire and he is created from clay. And some of the mystics of our tradition, they say Iblis was the first one to use qiyas, analogical reasoning. Right? He tried his intellect to right, override the divine commands. Right? Allah forgive us. <laughs> but is fire better than clay? That's not the point. 
That's not the point because what makes Adam, Adam was not clay. It was the Ruh. And this is the secret is that Adam is, uh, is that Iblis is veiled by Adam's outward form from his inner reality. And to not see the signs, to not see the names, to not see the inner realities, but to be materialists, i.e., focused only on the physical dimension, is to walk the path of Iblis. It's that simple. Is to walk the path of Iblis. May Allah save us from that path. And a stakbar, and he had kibr. Kibr means arrogance. The Prophet ﷺ said that anyone who has even a mustard seed of arrogance will not enter the garden. This is a frightening hadith. Because which one of us can say we have, we're free, completely free of arrogance? And the Sahaba were also scared. They said, Ya Rasulullah. A man likes to have nice sandals and nice clothes, <laughs> nice shoes and nice clothes, what we would say. Is that arrogance? The Prophet said, no. Arrogance is looking down on people and having disdain for the truth. Looking down on people and having disdain for the truth. In fact, in our, lex in, in our language, in Arabic, kibr, we would say pride, maybe, or arrogance, but you have to have a mutakabr ilay. In other words, you have to have someone that you're arrogant over. Kibr means you think you're better than someone or something. Whereas ujub in Arabic just means you're feeling yourself. Right? It's like vanity, vainglory. Like you're looking at the mirror like, yeah, man, I'm, man, I got it going on. That's a different word. That's just, that's bad. That's a sin. <laughs> Imam al-Ghazali has a book called Kibr and Ujub on both of these. They're both diseases of the heart. And of course, having a healthy sense of self, right, self-esteem, that's not bad. But the point is that you root it in the names. I have life. Allah is at hay. If I have speech, right, Allah is the one who speaks. Allah is the one who hears, Allah is the one who sees, Allah is the one who gives what He wills, a razaq So everything I have is from Him, you relate it to Him, you don't think it's of yourself. That's where you fall into ujub. But kibr is to think you're better than others. May Allah free us of all these diseases. And this is the disease of Iblis. I think this is the disease of Iblis and those that follow His way. Naam. And the last. Uh, passage that I'm going to look at inshallah is the third scene and in this scene Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah directly after that and we said O Adam you and your wife live in Jannah right? Hawa, our mother Hawa and eat from it freely whatever you wish but do not go near that tree. Do not go near this tree. Lest you be amongst the wrongdoers. But shaitan caused them to slip. And فَأَخْرَجَهُمَا مِمَّا كَانُوا And yani, this caused them to depart from what they were in. And Allah said, we said, Depart from this place, uh, enemies of one another. Yani, leave the garden, talking about Adam, the, the human beings, and Iblis, Shaitan. And you will, le you will now enter into the earth for a, a time as you're dwelling in your provision. And then, directly after, Fatalaka Adamu min Rabbihi. Kalimatin. And Adam received from his lords an, an address, and some words. And Allah relented towards him. Fataba alayhi. Turn towards him. Huwa Tawab Rahim. He is the oft relenting, the merciful, the one who accepts Tawbah. 
So this is really different from the biblical narrative for those that come from a Christian background because it's not like fire and brimstone, get out of here, you're cast out. It's like you, you were made to slip, but come closer. I'm going to give you some words. I forgive you, but you're going to leave this realm. Right? It's very different. And Allah said, leave this realm together. فَإِمَّا يَتِي يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدَى فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَى فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ So, you will leave this realm, but when guidance comes from me to you, whoever follows that guidance, no fear shall be upon them, nor shall they grieve. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَكَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا أُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ um, but those that deny the signs and يعني, reject them, those are the people of the fire, and there they shall remain. We ask Allah to protect us from that. So this sets up the, the cosmic drama, so to speak, of human existence. Now, Iblis... Or shaitan tricked them because he said, and in another verse he said, that if you, that Allah doesn't want you to eat this tree because you will live forever. Now, in the Quran, in the Bible, it's called the, the tree of good and evil, but in the Quran, it's called the tree of immortality. Now, the irony is that they were able to live in the garden forever if they followed the command, but because they did not follow the command, they were cast out, so to speak. And this is also a great wisdom we can draw, is that whenever we think our hawa is telling us to turn away from the divine commands and prohibitions, we always justify it to ourselves, right? right? I should take that loan with riba because any... I should this and this because, you know, in the, we justify it to ourselves, whatever we do. I know I shouldn't backbite, but did you hear about so-and-so, right? Whatever it is, we justify our actions. Allah forgive us. This is a trick because ultimately all good, all happiness, all joy, all safety, all that we truly want for ourselves and our loved ones, is in following, is in submitting, is in surrendering, surrendering. So may Allah make us of those who submit. And then this verse, when guidance comes, whoever follows it, no fear shall be upon them, nor shall they grieve. And this phrase is said in the Quran 14 times. La khufun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun. Said the Rahmik can correct me if that's the wrong amount, but I believe 14. And this is the description of those that follow the guidance, follow the prophets, and particularly the awliya. The awliya. And people ask, are there saints in Islam? We may not use the word saint, yani, but although it's not, there's nothing wrong with using it. A saint is someone who is sanctified. But the word wali means friend. Right? These are the friends of Allah. No fear shall be upon them, nor shall they grieve. And so Allah is just telling us that Though we are entering this realm of multiplicity from the realm of unity, the realm of forgetfulness from remembrance, the realm of hardship and difficulty from the realm of ease, that if we follow the guidance, we have nothing to fear and nothing to worry about. And may Allah forgive us our shortcomings and grant us blessings. Amen. You know, in this, uh, the rest of the chapter, a lot of what Imam al-Haddad goes into is the preeminence of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu to all prophets and all human beings and to his community over all communities. And we are blessed to be amongst his community. The last thing I want to say that's related to that is that we are human beings. And this is related to the names in all these verses. Other beings are fixed in their station. 
Angels are angels. They're beings of pure light and submission. They cannot leave that. Animals are animals. An animal cannot go against its nature. Animals can never be evil. Right? A lion, yeah, you might say, oh my God, look how it chases the zebra or the gazelle and catches it. But a lion never goes on a mass murder spree of zebras. Right? Only human beings commit such atrocities. They just go according to their nature. But the human being is a composite being. In other words, we have an angelic nature, but we also have an animal nature. We have spirit and we have clay. And we have the potential to be much worse than animals. To actually be influenced by a demonic and a, uh, you know, satanic influence, which causes us to do great harm and to shed blood and sow discord upon the earth, as the angel said. However, this is also the special gift to Beni Adam, because And this is why Allah said in a hadith Qudsi, I was a hidden treasure that loved to be known, so I created. Everything knows Allah in its specific way, at least one of His names. But the human being can know Allah in a way that is beyond everything. That is why the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the heavens and earth cannot contain me, but the heart of my believing servant can contain me. Yani, that hidden treasure that loved to be known, Qalb mu'min arsh rahman The heart of the believer is the throne of the all-merciful The treasure chest of that one is in your chest <laughs> Right That Allah is closer to us than our jugular veins And through following the prophetic guidance We can ascend to be angelic beings Beyond angelic beings Is that shocking? It might be because this verse is the great proof is that Allah commanded the angels to bow to Adam and that means, my brothers and my sisters Allah commanded the angels to bow to you Imam al-Haddad is telling us we were there we were in the loins of Adam Adam was not just once upon a time our ancestor he is the archetypal human being he represents each one of us we were there even if we're not aware of it. The angels prostrated to you. La ilaha illallah. And we have a choice to prove Allah right or to prove Iblis right. Because he said, I'm better. You shouldn't. Make these people in charge. But Allah said, I know what you don't know. To the angels. And so, the other proof of our potential is that who is the greatest human being? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Who is the greatest angel? Anyone know? Sayyidina Jibreel, alayhi salam. Our master Jibreel. Our master Jibreel took the Prophet ﷺ by the hand on the Isra al Mi'raj and ascended the seven heavens and ascended beyond the low tree and the furthest boundary and ascended until a point where he said this is my maqam I can go no further if I go any further my, my wings will burn you must go the rest of the way alone and the Prophet ﷺ ascended Two bows lengths or near And that's where he received the prayer That he gave us And he said that the Salat is the Mi'raj of the believer It is our ascension In other words, the greatest angel And he is our master, Sayyidina Jibreel He had a place, even he had a place That he could not ascend to where the greatest of human beings could ascend. And this is what it means to be Bani Adam. This is the nobility 
کرم نه بنی آدم احسنی تقویم ثم مرادناه اسفل سافرین that this is our birthright we are worthy of righteous deeds yani our true dignity our true yani nobility is that we are servants of Allah and he has ennobled us to the extent that we submit to him outwardly and inwardly surrender to him serve him follow the way of his beloved sallallahu alaihi wasallam outwardly and inwardly with every breath and when we fall short and we all do me first <laughs> We make tawbah, just like Adam did when he was caused to slip by shaitan. And Allah, at tawab rahim will wipe away those slips and continue to draw us near, inshallah, into his presence. So alhamdulillah wa shukrulillah, uh, this is the primordial realm. Those are the three scenes, if, if you will, that we should keep in mind. And just like we mentioned, right, in the origin story, movies are the great you know, superhero stories. And ple- again, like we said, all these writers, they're drawing on archetypes of the prophetic stories. They're drawing on religious imagery. Right? That's why this resonates with the human soul all across the world. Because they're, they're drawing attention to these prophetic archetypes. And so... Understanding this means that every breath we are trying to remember these lessons and remember our origin and remember our potential so that we can return to Allah in a way that pleases Him. And may Allah forgive our shortcomings, inshallah, and we do fall short. Um, Does anybody have any questions or reflections quickly? We... um, we have some a, a special occasion that will be coming at the close. But before that, does anyone have anything to ask, to reflect upon? Yes, sister. I think I have just a quick commentary. Please. I thought it was very interesting that you mentioned that uh, Adam and was in the garden and in trying to stay there forever, he ended up having to leave but then that also shows that in a way there's always been this yearning to return to Allah since we were born like as soon as we were created that's by definition already been almost a separation anxiety right like just like how a baby cries when he's born because this is the closest that when we were created we're the closest to Allah and that was still not enough. Mm-hmm. So either there's, you know, forgetfulness or distress, distress that we would stay there, or there's this yearning that started since our creation. Masha. So I just thought it was very interesting. <coughs> Masha. Beautiful insights, Yes. Yeah, I have a question. So when we were, we were in the primordial realm, did we know or did we willingly? MashaAllah. This is a good question. My understanding is that my understanding is that in that realm, because we knew Allah, we knew that whatever Allah decreed for us was good. And so that we trusted Allah, that there was a wisdom in this separation and to tie it back that some of our scholars have said in commenting on this there were certain names of Allah that we could only know through separation through right you can only you know and we know opposites right? things are known by their opposites the qabit al basit the expander and the contractor the one who gives life al muhi al mumit the one who gives life and the one who gives death the one who elevates and the one who lowers. So that's my understanding. Anybody else? Yes. Just reflecting on something you're saying, like in regards to the Khalifa and some other things that you said, like so like in, in executing 
our responsibilities, like in the realm of Khalifa, and like trying to execute those things while we live in systems that are not based on the rule of Allah, and how that creates like discordance because I can't really like, you know, if I want to execute something in the realm of justice, you know, I might say, for instance, like I forgive a human being. But the legal system says, like, we want to apply a punishment for their crime. So, like, it creates, you know, it's hard to feel like a sense of alignment sometimes because we're not, like, you know, it's it's not like a, it's not holistic in a way. Like, we're over here, like, yeah. in this one, yeah. you know, experience, you know, inshallah, like, submitting in one way or wanting to do what, you know, Allah wants us to do, but then, like, we're living in a, sometimes in systems that, you know, like, there's not that, what do you call, what would you call that? Like, the, yeah. Harmony. Or yeah, like, harmony, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, I mean, it's right. And that's the thing, inshallah, next week we'll get into the dunya and we'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, but the next world is, to, to, right, to foreshadow, it is a mix of light and darkness. It is a mix of heaven and hell, this world. We, we have shat, you know. And the, the alhamdulillah, the starting point of the believer is that everything is a test, ultimately. If we're given... Yeah, I need poverty. People say, oh, that's a test. And if we're given wealth, of course, that's also a test. If we're given power, it's a test. Powerlessness is a test. If we're given ease, it's a test. If we're given hardship, it's a test. All of it is a test. That's, that's our framework. And we take the means to always work for justice and good and whatever we can in this world. But we know that ultimately, to your point, perfect justice cannot be in this world. It just won't. And Imam Dawood Walid spoke about this this weekend that we do our best to strive for justice and mercy and goodness, but we also know this realm is not perfect. And so we strive to also have a, outwardly we work for whatever we can, but that's just adab with Allah because we know this is His affair. And so we plan a seed even if the last day is here. This is His affair. And so, yeah, you're right. I mean, this world is, is a tribulation, right? It's the bala. And, um, and uh, you know, Imam Ghazali, he comments on the name of Allah, Al-Muqsit, which you could say the equitable, right, the just. And he tells a story, he said that he, he defines the name as the one, Allah is the one who brings justice between people so that the wrongdoer and the one wronged feel complete and total satisfaction with the ruling, with the justice. Both the one who did the wrong and the one who was wrong. They feel like this was right. And he said, that's only Allah. No one, it, that won't happen in this world. We always feel a sense. And he tells an amazing story about Yom Al-Qiyamah. He said, two people will come on Yom Al-Qiyamah. And one wronged the other. And the one who was wronged will say to Allah, O oh Allah, you know, take from his good deeds and put it in my scale. And Allah will, tell, will, will say, he has no more good deeds. Either that man didn't do anything good, or he did so much wrong that they had already taken it from other people, right? He had nothing good. And so then, the man says, oh Allah, let him take my sins then. And then Allah doesn't say no, but Allah says, let me show you something. And he shows him a glimpse of the garden, a specific area of the garden. And it's so profound and so beautiful and so vast that he is like in a state of ecstasy just looking at it. And he said, oh Allah, who could afford this? And who is this for? Some prophet or some martyr or some great one? And Allah said, this is for the one who can afford it. And he said, who could ever afford this? And Allah said, you can. And he said, how? He said, if you forgive your brother, you can afford it. And he said, oh Allah, I already forgave him. He said, then take your brother by the hand 
and walk with him into the garden. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the reality. But this world will always break our hearts. And Rumi says, count it a blessing when loss comes your way in the lane of love. Because after that practice, whatever breaks your heart, now you're, that was practice to love the true beloved. And he gives the analogy, he said, a warrior gave his son a wooden sword to prepare for battle. And the boy was happy running around with the sword, and one day it broke. And he was crying, weeping, and he shattered because his sword was shattered. And his father smiled at him and said, this is a great day. I've been waiting for this day. Now it's time for a real sword. <laughs> In other words, Rumi's saying that this world is going to break our hearts. This world will break our hearts, but the wound is the place where the light enters. And um, may Allah be gentle with us, and may He make us of those who enter the garden and experience the wisdom of it, and have trust in Him here. You know, because not trusting in Allah is its own punishment. People that don't have certainty in Yaqeen and Allah, they are, that is a punishment in itself. May Allah forgive us and grant us sakina, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. So um, the special occasion is this. And uh, our brother Dave, David, is here in the back. Would you like to come up with me? So our brother, let me take this. Bismillah. So our brother Dave, I was trying to think about this. How many... Years have you been coming to what's the classes? Two, maybe? Two, yeah. It's been at least two because we've almost been in the pandemic two years and you were Yeah. You were three now. <laughs> you were there for a lot of the classes beforehand. And uh, alhamdulillah I received a message from my brother and he informed me that he is ready to take his shahada and to renew the primordial covenant and enter into Islam. And so, inshallah, um, what we'll do, do you have any questions first or any? Alhamdulillah. So I want to say, and I, I'm not, you know, hopefully I'm not flattering you, but I've seen our brother Dave in all these classes to the point I just assumed he was Muslim already. <laughs> and, and I said this to our brother Ramis, I said, some people that aren't Muslim take Islam more seriously than most Muslims. La ilaha illallah. And um, so, as was mentioned, and it's from Allah that we're talking about the covenant and renewing the covenant, this class. And the reality is that we're all renewing our covenant together, inshallah, with Allah, and we're striving to uphold it. And we all fall short. But this is the affirmation that we will do our, our best in all of our breaths and all of our moments to uphold that covenant. And so, inshallah, um, what we'll do is we'll say it in English and uh, you just repeat after me. And everyone else can say it along with him because it's good to renew your shahada. And um, what we'll do, inshallah, is we'll say it in English first and then in Arabic. I bear witness. I bear witness that there is no God but God. That there is no God but God. And Muhammad. And Muhammad is the messenger of God. Is the messenger of God. Ashadu. Ashadu. And la. And la. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illallah. Illallah. Wa ashadu. Wa ashadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Ashadu. And la, and la ilaha, ilaha illallah. Wa ashadu anna, anna Muhammadan, Muhammadan Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Ashadu and la, and la ilaha, ilaha illallah. Wa ashadu anna, anna Muhammadan, Muhammadan Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Takbir! Allah. Takbir! Allah. Takbir! Allah.
Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Walillahi alham. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allah is for you. Oh my goodness. La ilaha illallah. The brothers give him a hug, inshallah. <laughs> Walillahi alhamd Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar La ilaha Brothers please give him a hug sisters just brothers <laughs> Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar La ilaha illallah Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Walillahi alhamd MashaAllah So we pray by all of the divine names by the beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that Allah blesses our brother and blesses his path and grants great openings and great good for us and for him and accepts for us our renewing of the covenant and forgives our shortcomings and allows us to truly be the followers of the beloved sallallahu alaihi wasallam outwardly and inwardly and truly be khulafa truly be khalifas upon this earth serving allah on behalf of allah serving his creatures honoring this planet, honoring all beings upon it. And may Allah forgive our shortcomings. Alhamdulillah, ameen, ameen, ameen. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Miftahi wa barahmatullahi ala lama fi ilmi la salatu wa salam an da'imini bidu wa mukila wa ala alihi wa man wala. And with that, inshallah, we're, we're honored and um, We'll talk about the dunya, inshallah, next week. And um, we pray that Allah forgives us for any shortcomings and bless all of you. It's so beautiful to be together. I missed this. I missed you all. And uh, it's really a blessing to be in community. And, um, you know, may Allah not deprive us of these gatherings ever again. And may Allah not deprive us of gratitude for these gatherings. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum.